Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamancy. Tonight, a five-year-old girl is in critical condition after gunfire erupts at a toddler's birthday party in northwestern Toronto. She was just lying there, no smile, no tears, nothing. It's disgusting. They have no respect, and it hurts my heart. Children among the victims. As police search for multiple suspects, a community searches for answers. We have the resources to solve this crime, and we will solve it. Canada Day change-ups. After the country's reckoning with residential schools, some cities are trading in celebration for reflection this year. It's about the children. It's about the children that didn't make it home. Habs hype grips Montreal for game four. Probably going to get the goalie mask of Ken Dryden. We'll take you there. And celebrating dad while loosening COVID restrictions. It's a great feeling to be with your family again. Finally, I see the hope in people's eyes. I see how people's spirits have been lifted. This is The National. On a weekend filled with family celebrations, unthinkable gun violence shattered the joy at a child's birthday party. And tonight still threatens the life of a five-year-old girl. The shooting happened Saturday evening in the northwest corner of Toronto. Two other children were also wounded and a neighborhood is once again on edge. The newfound freedom of outdoor gatherings and the promise of fun on Father's Day now stained by heartbreak and fear. The CBC's Philip Lee Shannock visited the scene and spoke with a woman who tried to comfort the wounded five-year-old. Emma Lynn Redhead had just returned to the party in the courtyard of the townhouse complex when gunfire rang out. She was just lying there, no smile, no tears, nothing. She saw a five-year-old girl known as TT to friends and family. She ran to where she lay in the grass and held her hand until help arrived. I basically, I said, TT, you're okay, you're going to be okay. We're just waiting for the ambulance, just stay awake, okay? So I was just talking to her. Friends and family had gathered to celebrate a one-year-old's birthday party on a pleasant summer-like night, she says, when suddenly there were gunshots and screams. It's disgusting. They have no respect and it hurts my heart. Like, I couldn't even sleep last night to, you know, to just think about, like, how someone could actually come at a one-year-old birthday party and do this. Police were called to the area around 8 in the evening. They found four people wounded. A 23-year-old man with a gunshot wound to his leg, a 1-year-old boy grazed by a bullet, an 11-year-old boy hit in the lower body, and worst of all, that 5-year-old girl shot in the head. There's nothing more brazen than children outside in a gathering and, and this kind of violence happening outside right in front of them and them being victims. It's, it's absolutely tragic and we, more than anything or any other time, we need the community's help. This community activist says this kind of extreme uh, violence is new. Uh, we do know that, you know, there are some uh, issues in the area when it comes to um, gang activity and things along those lines. But even when it comes to your typical gang shooting, this is definitely not the norm. As much as this, this is a horrific, horrific situation, it could have been worse. They could, there could be three dead children. Police say a vehicle was seen leaving the scene, but details are being withheld to protect the investigation, including suspect descriptions. As far as motive, I can't say right now because, as you just said, there are a number of theories out there. Uh, a number of people have their own ideas. We're just uh, trying to work all, all through that, and I can tell you that we have the resources to solve this crime, and we will solve it. Police say there are surveillance cameras in the area and they were operating, but they're peeling for witnesses and dash cam video. Philip Lee Shannock, CBC News, Toronto. And today, leaders expressed their disgust with the potentially deadly violence. Toronto's Mayor John Tory tweeting, firing a gun anywhere, anytime in the city of Toronto is unacceptable. Doing so at a child's birthday party goes way beyond that. And Ontario's Premier Doug Ford said, my heart breaks for the innocent young victims of this senseless tragedy. No one who engages in this kind of heinous gun violence should get away unpunished. To the COVID-19 story now, and on this Sunday night, some good news. In the race between variants and the vaccines, while the exact finish line may be up for debate, one thing is certain, Canada is rushing towards it, this weekend surpassing an important milestone. Here's the percentage of the eligible population, that's Canadians age 12 and up, who have been vaccinated over the past three months. We've seen a surge to 75% with at least one dose and the start of an even more rapid rise of those with two doses to more than 20%.
For the Public Health Agency of Canada, this was a threshold for safely relaxing lockdowns. But in many provinces, reopening is already well underway. And as Brian Stewart shows us, the race against the virus isn't over yet. On a day celebrating all that dads do, beaches were full of people, upbeat about the summer ahead. We are really excited to get together. It's been a while. There's a growing sense of ease due to a drop in COVID cases and the climbing number of vaccinations. With more than 75% of eligible Canadians with one dose and just over 20% with two, this is the point that federal officials said it would be safe to open up. But there is another factor, the highly contagious Delta variant. The strain has been found in every province and at least one territory. It's been connected to an outbreak at a Calgary hospital where three have died, including a fully vaccinated woman in her 80s who had underlying health conditions. We should be taking it seriously because if we don't get those second doses in, it does provide an opportunity for the virus to continue to spread and mutate. That's why the goal remains to get more shots into arms by making it as accessible as possible. At this 32-hour clinic, there is even music courtesy of the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra. I think it's fantastic, you know, to get people uh, motivated to just get it done. That's what I did. This mosque in Halifax hosted a drive through clinic with translators on hand. So we do have uh, many people uh, volunteering today, representing so many uh, uh, languages and can speak so many languages, so that we uh, can get people here feeling comfortable. That's also why Indigenous groups in Toronto hosted what they were calling a powwow vaccination clinic. Me, I have anxiety. So for having that, I was really nervous. And then you come here, you hear people dancing, you hear people singing. It's just so amazing. And the country is on track to have enough vaccine to nearly double the number of fully vaccinated Canadians by the end of the month. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Some restrictions in Saskatchewan loosened today, including limits on customers in retail stores and limits on how many people can sit at one table in a restaurant. But the province has also announced the next crucial stage will go ahead in a matter of weeks. As of July the 11th, Saskatchewan will now lift all COVID-19 public health restrictions, including the province-wide mask mandate and outdoor gathering limits. All right, for more on some of today's COVID issues, let's bring in Dr. Peter Uni, member of Ontario's COVID-19 scientific advisory table. And Dr. Uni, a delay in shipments of Pfizer has led to Quebec pausing Pfizer's second doses for a few days. And in Ontario, people getting second doses in Toronto and Peel region will be getting Moderna, even if they got Pfizer as a first dose. So for anyone who's reluctant about that switching, uh, what would you say to them? Oh, absolutely no worry at all. In fact, my wife will get her second shot, being a Moderna shot on Tuesday after she received Pfizer first. Um, this evening, I received data here from Ontario indicating even that Moderna, if anything, might be a bit more effective against the Delta variant as compared with Pfizer. Interesting. Uh, let me ask you now about so-called breakthrough cases, people fully vaccinated who still get COVID. There was a report this weekend of a woman in her 90s who died. When we see reports like that, what should we make of it? We shouldn't make anything out of it. These vaccines are extremely good, but they're only 95% effective, not 100%. And this will happen every now and then. It's tragic, but it's a rare event. We've heard a lot, Dr. Uni, about vaccination thresholds, and we've hit them 75% first dose, 20% second. From an Ontario perspective, how significant is it to hit those numbers? Today, it's not completely significant yet. Why? We only are nine days after the first step of the reopening. And what we need is to figure out uh, next Friday, Saturday, or the coming Friday, Saturday, um, how the impact of the reopening is against the impact of the vaccine rollout. Once we know that, we're able to recalibrate the reopening and move on. All right, Dr. Uni, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And on that COVID death of a woman who had two shots of the vaccine, the 90-year-old lived at a facility where there is currently an outbreak, nine cases among staff and residents. On its website, officials said the woman had, quote, only shown mild symptoms, but as we've seen through the course of the pandemic, the virus can change quickly. Tomorrow, the federal government is expected to update the restrictions around crossing the U.S. border into Canada. And today we got a better idea of the goalposts they'll use when gauging how much those rules can loosen. 
Rafi Bujikanian looks at the possibilities. All passengers must wear a removable non-medical mask. There is no shortage of travelers hoping things get a little easier. This Toronto mom, fully vaccinated, is heading to visit her kids in the U.S. And she's budgeted for the controversial hotel quarantine on the way home. Of course, we have to budget for that. It's, uh, it's just uh, money that we don't have to spend it. And even I look at it uh, from the point of uh, the public health, it's better for public that we quarantine in our home because no one else is there. Social distancing. But there may be a nice surprise for travelers shortly. Nearly a month after an expert panel recommended ending mandatory hotel quarantines, calling them expensive for both the government and the public, there's a hint of change in the air. Changes with respect to the government assisted hotels, uh, perhaps some implication on, on who would be subject to quarantine, you know, what if what it means to be a fully vaccinated vaccinated traveler and what changes can now be accommodated accomplished for those people who are in, fa in fact fully vaccinated. The government is also facing pressure to loosen restrictions at land crossings. If you have the two vaccine shots, whether you're on this side of the border or the other, we should try to facilitate that traffic. This weekend's milestone, 75% with one shot and 20% with two, is what the government had said it would need to see before any movement towards normal. But today's message was there is still a ways to go before the border fully reopens. But we haven't reached the finish line. And the finish line is when a significant majority of Canadians, approximately 75%, are fully vaccinated. Federal officials are promising an update on border measures Monday morning as pressure to reopen also builds in the U.S. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says he wants a concrete plan to allow fully vaccinated people to cross. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. Meanwhile, the U.S. may have hit a ceiling when it comes to getting people interested in rolling up their sleeves. In fact, the country won't hit a target set for two weeks from tonight. But as Katie Simpson shows us, that's not stopping people from trying to put the pandemic behind them. Summer 2021 is off to a normal looking start. Here, it's as much a relief as a trip to the water park on a hot afternoon. I'm ecstatic. I've been, I've been looking forward to do something like this for so long. It's great to come out here, you know, be with your friends, have a good time. It's better than being locked up in the house. From Philadelphia. It's sounding normal too. What a performance by Thousands of fans filling arenas, cheering through the NBA playoffs. Get the facts, get the facts. The click of cameras at the first in-person film festival in North America since lockdown. Fire it. Americans are embracing pre-pandemic life. Good afternoon. Even though the U.S. is poised to miss a key vaccination goal. On July 4, we're going to celebrate our independence from the virus as we celebrate our independence of our nation. The president had aimed to get 70% of all American adults at least one COVID vaccine shot by July 4th. The White House will come up shy with best estimates hitting 68% by Independence Day. Even though cases and deaths have dropped off dramatically, it's still a concern as the Delta variant poses a great threat to the unvaccinated. It doesn't necessarily appear more pathogenic, meaning more dangerous, but it's infecting people more easily and it's starting to become very prevalent in the UK in communities that are unvaccinated. To try to convince the hesitant to get a shot, Washington, D.C.'s mayor and Dr. Anthony Fauci knocked on doors with offers of lottery prizes. He can enter to win a brand new Jeep. While Reverend Franklin Graham went on CNN to plead with evangelical Christians. COVID is a real uh, problem and it, it can destroy your life. If Joe Biden misses this goal, it will be one of his first COVID-related setbacks since taking office, though it will do nothing to slow the speed at which life is returning to normal here. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. An update to a story we reported on last week. Canadians vaccinated with AstraZeneca and hoping to see Springsteen on Broadway may now get the chance. At first, the theatre company putting on the show made tickets available only to those who were fully immunized by an FDA-approved vaccine. That meant Canadians who received AstraZeneca shots would be excluded. The company has since backtracked, opening it up to those with a WHO-approved vaccine as well. According to the Canadian press, the general manager of the Vegas Golden Knights is isolating after testing positive for COVID-19. 
Kelly McCrimmon traveled with his team to Montreal. His positive test announced hours before the Golden Knights faced off against the Montreal Canadiens tonight. Interim head coach for the Habs, Dominic Ducharme, is also isolating. He tested positive for COVID on Friday. Now, throughout these playoffs, the Canadians have been battling every step of the way. And after tonight's loss, they head to Vegas for Game 5, tied two apiece in the Stanley Cup semifinal. Valeria Corey Minocchio joins us from outside Bell Centre. And Valeria, what's happening there right now? Well, Ian, tonight many fans are wondering what could have been uh, this area, this side street that was once packed with people is the crowd is slowly dispersing. We've got fans heading home and, you know, heading home disappointed. They're, they had hoped that the Canadians with this game would take an even uh, larger lead in the series. The city has been absolutely buzzing in the hours leading up to the game. Go, Habs, go! It's no surprise Montreal has a case of Habs fever and fans aren't shy about it. Probably going to get the goalie mask of Ken Dryden, one of the greatest goalie of the Canadian and Montreal. This downtown Montreal tattoo shop is offering free Habs tattoos on game days during the playoffs. Fans lined up hours ahead of game four tonight. Atmosphere right now is actually, I would say, fire. And uh, we weren't expecting Montreal to go this far. But after we beat Toronto, I was like, all right, we're going all the way. We're winning the cup. That excitement has also poured over to some local businesses. Hard hit by the pandemic, the Canadian's playoff run has given this souvenir shop a boost. So I noticed uh, the sales 5 to 10 percent increase because of the Canadian qualification of the Canadians for the semifinal. Hours before puck drop, fans pop by the Bell Centre. Some among the lucky few to have tickets, others just to show their support. I think this is their season and they, there's some magic around this, um, yeah, around this year. I mean, everything is it, just gelling together the right time. Even with head coach Dominique Duchamp sitting out after testing positive for COVID-19, fans feel confident the Habs will survive their battle with the Golden Knights and reach the finals for the first time in nearly 30 years. The whole city is sitting on the edge of their seat waiting to see to see the city explode because believe me, every time they win and every time they will win, the city goes nuts. Everywhere. Now the city now, tonight that may not be the case, but the Habs know they're going to have to dig deep to, to, to take on uh, the, the Vegas Knights and hopefully win the series. Right now, the, the series is tied uh, with two games uh, apiece. Ian. And Game 6 will be back in Montreal soon. Valeria Cory Minocchio outside Bell Centre tonight. Another Canadian making waves in the sports world today. He's not the biggest name in golf, but Ontario's Mackenzie Hughes was right up there with the best of them. He started this day in a three-way tie for the lead at the U.S. Open. His sudden rise to the top may have surprised the golf world, but not his family. Greg Ross has the story. As he is Canada's hope. As Mackenzie Hughes was preparing to play on the biggest stage of his career, Back in his hometown of Dundas, Ontario, his mother and sister squeezed in 18 holes of their own on the course where Hughes was first introduced to the game. Sandra Hughes says it's hard to put her son's success into perspective. He's still just my boy. So, yes, he might be a great golfer, but he's also um, still just the kid that used to, I used to drive around on all of these different golf things and, you know, make him peanut butter sandwiches. But for his sister, Alex, today is huge. To be in the final group of the U.S. Open, that's amazing. That's quite the accomplishment. An accomplishment that created quite a buzz at the Dundas Valley Golf Club. He grew up here. This was his home course all the way through his junior golf. And then he went away to the States, and here we are today. It's going to be life-changing for everybody in the community here. And it's just amazing for Mackenzie Hughes to be in such a position now, regardless of how things work out. This for Birdie. Hughes's play on the course has thrust him and his family into the spotlight. Earlier this week, he told reporters his mother is a rock star. She's a registered nurse and has been working on the front lines of the COVID pandemic. Really, I am just one of many and we're just, you know, nose, nose to the grindstone and trying to do the very, very best we can. And of course, it's the pandemic that prevented Hughes's family from being in San Diego this week to watch him play in person. It is weird, but 
this is what we have to do to kind of get things back to normal. We're going to follow the rules and make sure we're just rooting for them really hard from back home. Oh, wow. Things didn't turn out quite the way they would have hoped. There is the ball. After some difficult shots, including a double bogey when his ball got wedged in a tree, Hughes slipped down the leaderboard. But in the end, he made his mark at one of golf's biggest tournaments. Kenzie Hughes, huge week for him. His family is convinced it won't be the last time. Greg Ross, CBC News, Dundas, Ontario. We are a little more than a month out from the start of the Tokyo Olympics, and today, organizers showed off the complex where the 11,000 athletes will be staying. The village not only includes apartments, but also a shopping centre, a post office and dry cleaners. Athletes will be shuttled in and out for COVID testing, and they'll have to wear their masks except when eating or sleeping. But already the first case of COVID in an arriving contingent has been recorded. A member of Uganda's national team, by some reports a coach, registered the positive test. All members of the team had received both shots of the AstraZeneca vaccine and had tested negative before boarding their flight. The team member is being held in a Japanese government facility. Some cities are putting plans for Canada Day on pause as the country reckons with the legacy of residential schools. I think it's important for us to stop, to reflect and to take in the impact of that. How some are planning to mark the day differently. Plus, a Toronto company is looking to shake up the wine industry. How white is wine? It's so white. Oh my gosh. Why more diversity could mean more unique flavors. I Aww. And celebrating dads. I see how people's spirits has been lifted. How families are marking a more hopeful Father's Day. Stay with us. Welcome back. Canada Day is fast approaching, but with the legacy of residential schools thrust into the spotlight in recent weeks, some cities and towns don't feel much like celebrating. Aaron Broman spoke to community leaders who have made tough decisions about what to do on July the 1st. Canada Day is usually a big deal in La Ronge, Saskatchewan, but this year the celebrations are on pause. It's about the children. It's about the children that didn't make it home. The reported discovery of children's remains at the former Kamloops Residential School has shaken the nation, and celebrating this country's complex legacy didn't feel right to some. The 215 children um, didn't have a, a, you know, didn't have their parents to be there when before they passed, or what, not knowing what happened, and then the parents not having a say or not having a voice uh, to be able to put closure. They'll honor those families on Monday, a gathering of nearby communities to mark National Indigenous Peoples Day. Other communities have also decided to cancel events on July 1st, including Victoria and Penticton, where a local Indigenous leader made a request of the city's mayor. Chief Gabriel also made a note that if we were to cool down uh, the celebrations this year, it would be uh, greatly appreciated. The local nations are, are really uh, reeling and, and, and grieving, and it just seemed uh, the respectful thing to do. St. Albert, Alberta is cancelling its fireworks display, which have always happened over the grounds of a former residential school. And Prince Edward County in southern Ontario will do nothing. When we took a step back, the reality was is that we were grieving. Ottawa's celebrations are mostly virtual because of the pandemic, but they are still a go for now. It should be revisited, but in a positive way. I don't necessarily think that people need to cancel their celebrations. I think it's important for us to stop, to reflect, and to, to take in the, the impact of that. Something that must happen, she says, before we can move forward. Aaron Broman, CBC News, Winnipeg. As Aaron mentioned, tomorrow is National Indigenous Peoples Day. We'll have extensive coverage across CBC News, including on the National tomorrow night. Adrian will interview the Honourable Murray Sinclair, who chaired the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And as Canada still struggles with the legacy of residential schools, 27 years ago, a northern community took matters into its own hands. It built a monument to remember the children who died at their school, but as the CBC's Juanita Taylor learned, a great deal of work still needs to be done. 
smell the wood fire, make tea, and very peaceful. Inside her teepee is where Kathy Pope finds solace. It's what she was seeking in 2018 when she traveled over 600 kilometers to honor people buried in an unmarked grave. It was something I'll never forget. The traditional Dene ceremony left a lasting impression on Pope. Many of the dead were residential school students. Three were her relatives. I was very happy and very sad, all so mixed emotions, so very much. The graves are here in Fort Providence, near the site of the Sacred Heart Residential School. It operated between 1867 and 1960. Today, this monument memorializes around 300 people buried here, including 161 children brought to the school from up and down the Mackenzie River Valley. A sacred area for, for our family, for our community here in Fort Providence. Albert Lafferty says people in Fort Providence talked about the unmarked graves for years. His Denny ancestors are buried here too. In the early 90s, Lafferty led a push to ensure the old burial ground would never be developed. They brought in ground penetrating equipment to search for remains. All of the, uh, our ancestors and all of the uh, children who are buried here. So it's a very special and uh, sacred place for us. Lafferty worked with the Roman Catholic Diocese of Mackenzie, Fort Smith and Yellowknife to find out who they were. And his research also confirmed what the community had already feared, that in 1948, the church plowed over the burial ground, but not before relocating eight missionaries to the community's current cemetery. Lafferty says then the church turned the site into a potato field. Yes, it is uh, unsettling as to why that, that was necessary, but we don't have the precise answers for that. Uh, from Fort Good Hope, when I was 12 years old. In 1994, the efforts of Lafferty and others paid off, and a monument was erected to honour the people buried here. And getting the names and the monument project itself uh, offers some sense of closure. There's still a lot more work to be done for, for survivors and descendants. Sam Gargan is a former Grand Chief of the Decho First Nations. He also went to residential school. I spend just about one winter with my parents. But as soon as the church found out where I was, they came to where I was and, and they grabbed me with the RCMP. Gargan says the monument is only a start. In order for our people of my generation and even our children's generation to heal, and that process to begin, you have to hear an apology from the church and from the RCMP. But for Kathy Pope, the monument has been an important part of her healing journey. I never ever used that word closure, so, you know, it gave me peace of mind. Pope plans to make the trip back to Fort Providence. So they feel they're not forgotten. And Juanita Taylor joins us from Yellowknife. Juanita, we know there have been calls from Indigenous groups across the country for a papal apology for the Catholic Church's role in residential schools. So what's happening in the Northwest Territories? Well, Ian, recently an apology was made by Bishop John Hansen of the Mackenzie Fort Smith Roman Catholic Diocese in Yellowknife. But it's not clear if that apology has been accepted by the people of the Northwest Territories. Now, people we've spoken to in several communities say they want the Pope to apologize. And in fact, leaders from the Métis National Council, the Assembly of First Nations and Inuit Tapari Kanatami will be traveling to Rome to ask for that apology in person. Ian? All right, Juanita, thank you. Throughout the pandemic, we brought you the stories of people across the country, each with their own experiences from struggle to serious change. Next, we check in on three of them. I didn't know that you needed to be this resilient. Lessons learned after a year of challenges. Next.
We have been bringing you the stories of how Canadians across the country have been affected by the global pandemic, from loss to resilience, and for some, even positive change. Experiences have been diverse, and tonight, Nick Purden catches up with three people he spoke to at the height of the COVID crisis and finds out how they're doing now. Every one of us, no matter who we are, has been through a lot because of COVID. Now that the pandemic might be coming to an end, I wanted to find out how some of the people I spoke to during the height of the crisis are doing today. When I first met Ruth Clausen at her cheese factory in Stratford, Ontario, her business was on the brink. I mean, if we lose a business, then I'm sleeping on one of my kids' couches, and that would make me sad. It would disappoint me. Almost a year later, Ruth's business is still struggling. And she tells me that being so close to bankruptcy for so long has taken its toll. I'm weary. It's been a long haul. Sometimes I feel like I'm one of those punching dolls that you've just been knocked down so many times and gotten yourself back up. But I feel like I've sprung a leak and it's harder and harder to get back up. But Ruth knows the fight isn't over. She's thought a lot about the end of the pandemic and what it will mean for her and her business. I think the end of the pandemic will be one of optimism and joy. And I think it's so exciting. What worries me is just that whether we'll have enough juice left to get started back up again. You know, it's sort of like helping a woman through labor and just saying, let's just get through the next contraction. Let's just take this one at a time. But then you're just so exhausted at the end. Ruth knows that the money she receives from the government will dry up this fall. And she's not really sure if her business will survive after that. Oh, God. I, I didn't... I didn't know that you needed to be this resilient. Um, and I guess I've learned that I have some resilience and some flexibility, but God, I wouldn't mind a year of not having to do that for a little while and just maybe making cheese. That would be so great, yeah. We've all lived through the unknowns of the pandemic. And even when it ends, some uncertainty will continue. That's also true here at this encampment in Alexandra Park in Toronto. It's a home away from home. When I first met Domenico Succida this past winter... It's all completely sealed in. He said there was actually an upside to the pandemic. The public knows what's going on out here. Even people out of town have been coming to this park to bring clothing, supplies, etc. Anything and everything that we need. Half a year later, Domenico has become one of the most recognizable people here. Are you the mayor of Alexandra Park? <laughs> yeah, they call me the mayor, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what they call me. Domenico has helped many people move into the park during the pandemic. The population here exploded as some shelters became COVID hotspots. Domenico here. can't hold back his anger they about that. Alone. You got 10,000 Canadians riding on the street starving. You should, should be ashamed of yourselves, the whole country. During the pandemic, the city of Toronto has actually allowed people like Domenico to tent in the parks. But now the situation has changed. The city says that because they've offered people in encampments a place to live, they have the right to remove them. That's already happened in Toronto at least once recently, with police showing up on horseback. Really? Horses to stomp on homeless people because they got nowhere to live. We all look out for each other. So when the police go after one group, they're going to be dealing with every person in this park. And they're going to realize that a lot of people care about each other out here. It's no wonder that here, nobody's really looking forward to the end of the pandemic. That just means even more uncertainty. You know, what's your future, you think? I don't know what my future is. I turn 51 tomorrow. So I'll make it two to another birthday. My future's still up in the air. I don't know if I'm ever going to have my own place. Whether I'm going to get off the street. I don't know when my future is coming. Every day I wake up and I'm not, I'm not bleeding or having more stitches in me, I bless. The pandemic has meant hardship for most of us. But for some, the restrictions and the lockdowns actually proved helpful. COVID hits and the world stops, literally. When I first met Corel Peters this past winter, she was upset that because of COVID, her parents wouldn't get to see her graduate. She wanted to honor the sacrifices they made so she could go to university. You know, my parents are immigrants and I'm the first in my family to pursue a university education. And so I was really looking forward to getting that diploma and my parents being there. Today, Corral has graduated. 
She has a full-time job. But she says her biggest takeaway from the pandemic is how it changed her relationship with her parents. I was home for months, and I spent a lot of time with my parents all day, every day, because I wasn't seeing anyone else. And so I guess it made me really value spending time with my mom and dad more than I did before. Right. I was grateful. You know, we, we had family members that died from COVID, and I was just really fortunate that the people in my immediate life were all safe. Becoming closer during the pandemic meant that after she graduated, Carell's mom told her something she never had before. She told me that she was proud of me for graduating um, and like getting a job. And in like our culture, that's not something that's expressed really often. Like I know she is, but it's not something she verbally expresses. I think that turnaround moment for her was kind of, okay, I came to this country and even for my dad as well, but maybe a bit more for her. Um, her struggle was worth it to see me succeed. So pretty. Corral will have something good to remember when this is all over. Her life changed, but it didn't stop. I guess in the end, the pandemic has taught me to appreciate life more. And I guess part of that comes with age, but I think the pandemic kind of sped that up a bit. Almost like it made me grow up a bit faster. Hopefully the things we've learned during the pandemic can help us when it's over. Appreciating those around us, fighting back, and maybe above all else, figuring out how to live with uncertainty. Nick Purden, CBC News, Toronto. As Canada reopens, the patios are filling up and so are wine glasses. But a Toronto company wants to change who is picking the wine. My palate is very different from a white person's palate. Coming up, changing the face of the wine industry and why it could change the type of wines on shelves. Next. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, infighting and allegations of racism and sexism as a Green Party member crosses the floor. What does this mean for the future of the Greens? Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. The wine world, the drink and the industry has an image as elitist, particularly as male dominated and overwhelmingly white. Katie Nicholson introduces us to some women who are working to make wine more inclusive. Mm. This wine is delicious. This wine yeah. is so so to some, just friends drinking wine. I really think I could rock some like heavy, greasy fried food with this wine, and I think that would be phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> but this is a revolution in a glass. We don't have to be limited by these preconceived yeah. notions of, oh, if you have a red wine, you can't eat white meat with it. It's like, the hell I can't. No. <laughs> These are the Grape Witches, a wine boutique in downtown Toronto, and they're conjuring change in the wine industry. How white is wine? It's <laughs> so white. Oh my gosh, it's pretty white. So white, Jabby Dale never seriously thought they could have a future in wine. I'm first generation Canadian, and when you look at the world of wine, you don't often hear tales of the children of immigrants um, being able to make their way through the industry. Yes, you'll see a lot of people who look like me in the kitchen, but the managers, the sommeliers, the owners were more often than not white people, specifically white men. Lorraine Kodiamet knows all about that. The Grape Witch's manager has been in the food and wine industry for more than a decade. She says women of color aren't given the same respect. There's immediate distrust as to whether or not you know what you're talking about, whether or not you have all of the knowledge that you have. Delicious Queen of Sierra Red, can't wait. For years, Nicole Campbell and Krista Oben have been trying to carve out a safe space for women in the male-dominated wine world. They soon realized they needed to do more. It's one of our biggest parties of the year. We rent out uh, a huge boat on the water and we have a 500 person natural wine dance party. And there were a group of black folks who were there and they were like, this is my favorite party of the year. Why aren't there more black people here? Like, you got to get more black people here. And I was like, thank you so much for saying this to me. Like, do you mind? Like, can we talk about this? Like, like, tell, like tell me how I can make this more accessible. One of the things that needed to change, who can afford to study wine? 
And one of the first barriers that I engaged with was money. Like I couldn't afford it. Simple as that, unless I was willing to lie, cheat, and steal my way through wine education. When you start studying for a certain level of certification, you should expect to spend $200 a week on wine. My rent is like $950. I give this one a deep root. And so the Grape Witches summoned the money for a scholarship specifically to help women of color get higher wine education. Jabby is the first recipient, but as they've learned, even if you can afford the price of admission, there are other barriers. Feeling unwanted. Walking into rooms where I've been approached by people who will then ask me to bring them some water because they look at me and don't expect me to be here to taste. They look at me and expect me to be here to wait upon them. It's not just who gets to learn about wine, it's about challenging how wine is valued. What we think of as like the best grapes are of course informed by uh, political and social factors in like the 17th and 18th and 19th century and 20th century. So you have something like this, which is Georgian. Thumbing and their noses at the Eurocentric tradition, wine, Grape Witches is stocking their shelves with like wine regions Julia. outside uh, of the mainstream. Beautiful uh, grouping of indigenous grapes. They call it a decolonized approach to wine. Not just rich white people want to drink wine. Everyone loves wine. So this kind of idea that the value is only placed on white bodies and, and only their interests and only what they want to drink is a value. My palate is very different from a, a white person's palate and what I want to drink in wine is very different. So the first one was the uh, methyl. Empowered, Jabby has That's launched their the own business with their friend, cool. Jason Zinger. The, these packs you get the chance to have a good taste of the wines and really dive into them and study them. And its mission? To make high quality wine accessible to those who can't afford a whole bottle, one glass at a time. Repackaging tasting experiences in these small packets. In order for us to have a more community minded approach to wine, we have to include everyone. And you can't include everyone if not everyone can afford it. So that's, that's the hope and the dream. More than anything, Jabby and the Grape Witches want to share the joy and magic of wine with as many people as possible. Just give us a little taste. And prove anyone can be a wine expert. So what's the first scent you smell? Like a, a sharp green apple. So I've always been of the opinion, each one teach one. I have the capacity to do this, so I'm going to do it. Other people are gonna see me do it and maybe believe that they have the capacity as well. And it can just start going and going and, and that's going. something they can all drink to. Vive la Révolution. Vive la Révolution. <laughs> Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. Yeah. No, that's, that smells delicious. And a clink of the glasses for dads. My favorite thing about my dad is that he's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> Next, some families are finally able to celebrate Father's Day together. We'll look at how some of those ended up spending the day. Stay with us. The CBC Sports app. Get insight on their journey and go deep on going deep. Watch, read, listen on the road to Tokyo on the CBC Sports app. Beautiful weather and fewer restrictions across much of this country led to a very happy Father's Day for many. As some reunited with friends and family for the first time in months. Reflections on dad and celebrating life and love during a pandemic is our moment. We feel great and it's a beautiful day to be out here with the family and friends. It's been a long time and I know for the kids especially being able to get everybody together and to be with friends, it's, it's a nice way to spend the day. One of my favorite things about my dad, I have a, a lot, but one of them is that he made me. Oh! oh. I, 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 I helped. My favorite thing about my dad is that he's my dad. <laughs> We're enjoying the day and it's a perfect day. We haven't been like doing this get together for like a couple months, what, so it's... More than a year. It's a great feeling to be with your family again. <laughs> we decided to have some family, uh, family and friend gathering and just spending the, time, uh, the day chilling. Finally, uh, I see the hope in people's eyes. I see how people's spirits has been lifted and it's very exciting to see how we can finally get back to a, a normal lifestyle. Hug. 
Aww. It does feel like a different kind of Father's Day because, as we've heard, so many families getting together for the first time in a long time, especially extended families. And then there are lots of people whose dads live on the other side of the country, like mine, or in other parts of the world. So on behalf of all of those sons and daughters, let me wish my dad a happy Father's Day. And I can't wait to get back to New Brunswick. That is a national for June 20th. Good night.